The Ear to Asia podcast is made available on the Jakarta Post platform under agreement between the Jakarta Post and the University of Melbourne. Hello, I'm Jane Hutchin. This is Ear to Asia. In Thailand, the current monarch is unlike his father, King Pumipon, who passed away in 2016. He cultivated the image of a bodhisattva king, you know, a morally pure being. A large part of the population really did see him as a very uh, virtuous king in the Buddhist sense. His son is not in the image of the traditional Buddhist ruler. And there are Buddhists on both sides of the fence who are, I think, sort of dissatisfied. That idea of territorial exclusion and coming up with Buddhist exceptionalism and saying we have to get rid of all of these people, push them all out of Burma. So you're getting this Buddhist-Muslim tensions all along that border region, these awful tensions for the people on the ground who used to live in a much more mixed way. In this episode, Mindful of Power, Politics and Nationalism in Buddhist Majority Societies. Ear to Asia is the podcast from Asia Institute, the Asia Research Specialists at the University of Melbourne. Nonviolence and detachment are central to Buddhist teachings, and the reputation of Buddhism, particularly in the West, is generally that of a peaceful religion. Yet in the last decade, there have been growing accounts of human rights abuses often along ethnic lines in Buddhist-majority countries like Myanmar and Sri Lanka, carried out in the name of Buddhism and not infrequently instigated or abetted by Buddhist monks. In this episode of Ear to Asia, we examine how Buddhist traditions and contemporary perspectives impact political life across those countries in South and Southeast Asia, in which most people are adherents of Theravada Buddhism. So how does Buddhism intersect with power? How might appealing to Buddhist beliefs or cultural norms be used or abused to promote political ends? How much room is there for diversity of beliefs, including non-Buddhist ones? And how has Theravada Buddhism itself been changed by the demands and constraints of the modern nation-state? Joining me to examine the junction of Buddhism, social life and politics in majority Theravada Buddhist countries are Southeast Asia historian Associate Professor Patrick Jury from the University of Queensland and cultural and environmental historian of Asia, Dr Ruth Gamble from La Trobe University. Welcome to Ear to Asia, Patrick, and welcome back, Ruth. Thanks, it's great to be here. Thank you. I want to start off with a broad brush. You know, a lot of Westerners tend to think of Buddhism as a a peaceful religion and fold Buddhist terms and practices into, you know, we talk about mindfulness. There are principles of nonviolence and detachment that are central to Buddhist teachings. Patrick, perhaps you could start for us. What are the key tenets of Buddhism? Well, Buddhism uh, has influenced a huge geographical region, um, the Indian subcontinent, Central Asia, East Asia, including China, Korea, Japan, and Vietnam, and most of Southeast Asia. And as Buddhism moved into these regions, it's been influenced by their societies and cultural traditions. So it's actually very diverse. But to boil it down to its essence, perhaps we could say that the central tenet of Buddhism can be summed up by the doctrine of the Four Noble Truths which are traditionally believed to have been explained by the Buddha in his first sermon. And what he said was the four noble truths are firstly suffering, that life is full of suffering. Secondly, that suffering has a cause. Thirdly, that there is an end to suffering. And fourthly, that there is a path that can lead people to the end of suffering. And the Buddha taught uh, that path. I think Buddhists everywhere, no matter what school they belong to, what particular perspective they have, they will all believe in those four noble truths. Ruth, I wonder, in your view, what are the key differences between the different types of Buddhism? How does Theravada Buddhism differ? So there's three main schools of Buddhism 
that we have in Asia and also have spread to the rest of the world, they kind of developed from different trajectories from India. Uh, the Theravada tradition, which is in Southeast Asia and in Sri Lanka, which has a big focus on the monastic community and bases uh, their traditions on the Pali scriptures, which are some of the oldest scriptures. And then you have these two other traditions, the Mahayana and Vajrayana tradition. So the Mahayana tradition is different from the Theravada tradition in that they say all humans or all beings, including animals and spirits and gods and so on, have the capacity to become a Buddha. And so they make a commitment to not just uh, leave a cyclic existence and become an arhat, but commit to attain awakening for the benefit of all sentient beings. Uh, so this is the form of Buddhism that's practiced in China and in Japan and in Vietnam, large areas of Vietnam. And this is the one that has a lot more celestial bodhisattvas in it. Uh, so Guan Yin and uh, Avalokiteshvara and Manjushri, uh, these kind of celestial bodhisattvas that people tend to do prayers to, um, as opposed to just meditating on the image of the Buddha. And then there's another form of Buddhism, Vajrayana, which comes out of the Mahayana tradition but has more of a focus on transformative yogic meditation practices. And this is the form of uh, Buddhism that you find in the Himalaya and Tibet and Mongolia and up even into Siberia. But those broad strokes don't give you the full picture because there's a lot more overlap than you'd at first think. Uh, so there are practitioners of the Mahayana and Vajrayana in what are nominally Theravadan countries, and the Mahayana and Vajrayana contain a lot of the practices associated with the Theravada, which they see as being foundational to their religion. Patrick, I wonder why is Theravada dominant in, in Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, Sri Lanka and Thailand and to minorities in India, Bangladesh, China, Nepal, Vietnam? I mean, I mean how did that happen that those countries specifically became majority Theravadans? It's an interesting question and the answer is a little bit mysterious because these countries, mainly Southeast Asia, Mahayana Buddhism was actually formally dominant, particularly in Cambodia during the Angkor Wat period, together with, with Hinduism, particularly the Vaishnavite Hinduism. There, there were the Theravada tradition and the, the Pali scriptures in particular, which is the sort of central element of, of Theravada, that they were known going back to the 5th century of the Common Era, but it's the 13th century where Theravada just sort of takes over mainland Southeast Asia. Sri Lanka plays a major role also in, in that. Uh, the Thais, they uh, uh, sort of import some Buddhist monks and scholars from Sri Lanka to kind of help them solidify the tradition. It's a tumultuous period for mainland Southeast Asia. The Mongols have invaded from the north. You know, the Mongols are going crazy all over Asia. And there are huge political changes taking place. The Thais are just starting to break free from the Angkorian Empire. And it seems that Theravada Buddhism offered a kind of a new kind of religious practice that fitted into these big political and social changes that were taking place at that time. So how did the, I suppose, the more militant elements of Theravada Buddhism, how were those born? I would put it back to, and I don't want to blame everything on the colonials, I think it's a little bit simplistic, but what happened during the colonial period, a very important thing happened, and in, this includes Sri Lanka, that was the overthrow of the Buddhist monarch. Now, within the Theravada tradition, I think perhaps this is fair to say more so than other traditions, the monarch is the defender and the patron of the Theravada Buddhist religion. Of course, in the case of uh, Siam or, or Thailand as it's known today, the monarchy continued up until 1932 when there was a a movement, a political movement led by um, Western educated civilian bureaucrats and mid ranking military officers, which overthrew the absolute monarchy. Thailand was one of the last absolute monarchies in the world. They actually retained it as a constitutional monarchy, but there was the, the monarch sort of lost its symbolic position as, as sort of the head of the, uh, the Buddhist monkhood. And with the, the rise of communism also during the Cold War, this also was seen as a threat to the Buddhist community. So from about this time, from about the, the colonial period, the 19th century, and it kind of increases over the course of the 20th century, there's a real strong sense within the Theravada Buddhist community in, in mainland Southeast Asia, at least, that Buddhism is under threat. And that becomes increasingly uh, more intense. In fact, in the Buddhist tradition, like a lot of religious traditions, there is sort of millenarian thinking um, that you know, the end of the world is nigh and we need to uh, 
make amends for our sins and so on. So you have that in Buddhism already. And so the, the political events of the 19th to 20th century kind of accentuate that already existing sort of millenarian feelings. You know, 1957 is a really important turning point because that's the 2500th anniversary of the founding of the Buddhist religion. And, you know, there's all this activity in Southeast Asia and I think Sri Lanka as well to kind of draw attention to the, the state of Buddhism not just Theravada, but the Theravada ones, of course, were focused on their tradition and, you know, what to do to protect and defend the religion. And this is when we see the sort of the roots of this kind of Buddhist nationalism that, that arise, particularly with the founding of the nation states, because Buddhism actually doesn't really have a major role to play in the independence movements. You know, it was basically nationalism and communism that fueled those independence movements that eventually ended with the end of colonial rule and the establishment of new nation states. But once you had a nation state, that raised the question of the whole status of religion in this new nation state. And this is when we start to see Buddhism connected with a conception of national identity. And this is the roots of the, the kind of Buddhist nationalism that we see, particularly in Myanmar, Sri Lanka. To a lesser extent, I think in Thailand, the monkhood is more controlled. The whole Buddhist scene is more controlled there for interesting reasons. And the same, I think, could be said for Cambodia and Laos, where you have authoritarian regimes, one communist in Laos and one under the strongman Hun Sen, so that they've got a pretty tight control over the Buddhist establishment. But we're seeing, I think, the rise of this kind of Buddhist nationalism, which is fueled not really so much by doctrinal issues, but the, the sense that uh, Buddhism is under threat and Buddhists need to defend their tradition. Can I just jump in there as well? Because I was thinking that's a little bit different in Sri Lanka because the Buddhists were involved with the movement to um, get rid of the British. They'd been colonised by first the Portuguese, then the Dutch, and then the British. And they had this uh, reformist movement from the 1880s when you had people from the Theosophical Society, Henry Steele, Olcott, and so on coming to Sri Lanka. And they started promoting Buddhism and they promoted this form of Buddhism they called Protestant Buddhism uh, based on texts. Yes, he's a fascinating character. Just tell us a little bit about this American. He was deeply passionate, but he was also not a Buddhist. Henry Steele Olcott didn't start off as a Buddhist. He travelled to Sri Lanka with Madame Blavatsky. He started off as a theosophist, but then they, they tended to have murky um, borders between <laughs> um, what was a theosophist and what wasn't. But there was a sense at this point that uh, because the uh, British were promoting Protestantism, Christian form of Protestantism, and they were denigrating the Catholic ritualistic traditions at the same time, that maybe Theravada and the, particularly the form practised in Sri Lanka had similarities with Protestantism, like Christian Protestantism. I mean, he started off as a theosophist, but he was definitely promoting Buddhism at the end and a particular form of scriptural, logical and uh, like rational form of Buddhism. And, and this is kind of a colonialist presentation of Buddhism in the West as a philosophy, as a meditation practice um, that was a lot of the time stripped of the rituals and the, the uh, social elements. I wouldn't say it's nationalistic at this point, but royal aspects there's a better word for that, but I can't remember it, uh, the royal aspects of Buddhism and its connection to the Dharma kings and so on, they were kind of stripped by this Protestant Buddhism perspective that was then exported to the West. And the other thing I was going to add, I really liked what Patrick was saying about this combination of the uh, Buddhist traditions with the nationalism. And there was another element to this, I think, too, though, was that the nation state when it started being formed after the British Empire dissolved, and it was mainly the British in this area at that time, um, it was much more focused on territory than the earlier forms. So beforehand when you had everybody, all these different subjects under British rule, because the British were ruling everywhere, it didn't matter if you had smaller groups overlapping each other. So it's the same with partition in India. What you had happening was these hard borders or in Sri Lanka's case, it was the entire island was seen as a Buddhist island where beforehand you'd had Hindus and Muslim, Muslim enclaves and Catholic enclaves in this space. After that, there was like this mapping of nation state onto national territory. And therefore, there was a move towards uh, uniformity across that space, which hadn't been there before. And this created a lot of tension between the majority Buddhists and the minorities 
within the the community. And it's interesting because most of the tensions today seem to be between Buddhists proposing that Islam is a threat to their tradition. But in Sri Lanka for a while, you also had them proposing that the Hindu Tamils uh, were a threat to their tradition. But it's, yeah, two different others that have been presented during this entire period. Let's talk a bit about the role of the monarch in Theravada Buddhist societies. The monarch is pivotal, isn't he? Patrick? Yes, absolutely. And I think this helps us understand this whole question of the relationship between church and state, religion and state, which is a big question, of course, in every religious tradition. You know, in the case of uh, Christian Europe, we, we see this, this separation develop over time. In the case of the kingdoms of Southeast Asia, the main the Theravada kingdoms of Southeast Asia, the two are fused really in the person of the king. As I said, the king is the defender and protector and patron of the Buddhist religion. Up until the, the colonial period, there was a, a kind of a Theravada theory of monarchy, which understood the kings to be bodhisattvas. Now, everyone has probably heard of the Buddha, but they may be less familiar with the term the bodhisattva. And a bodhisattva is, is a being, a human, just a person who has made a pledge a long time ago to become a Buddha, to become enlightened as a Buddha in a future incarnation. But in order to do that, he has to perfect himself. And there's a theory of the, the 10 perfections. There's, there's the perfection of giving, the perfection of wisdom, the perfection of, of patience, of equanimity, so on and so on. So over hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of lifetimes, you perfect yourself to such a degree that you can one day become enlightened as a Buddha. This theory of the Bodhisattva was taken on by the kings. They presented themselves as these. It's kind of like a Theravada version of the divine theory of monarchy. Um, they added their own dynastic lineage onto the lineage of the Bodhisattva as represented in the Theravada Buddhist scriptures. So it's as though they're kind of part of the same lineage of the Buddha and all of the, the Buddhists before him. They often take on the name of the famous Emperor Ashoka. This is the third century Indian emperor who converted to Buddhism and played a major role in spreading Buddhism throughout the subcontinent, almost to every part of the subcontinent. And his son also uh, took Buddhism to Sri Lanka. So Ashoka, the Emperor Ashoka, is a key figure for the Theravada monarchs. And as part of this whole kind of theory, they are bound by what is known as the 10 royal virtues. Again, this comes out of Theravada Buddhist scripture. You don't have a constitution, of course. It's kind of like an absolute monarchy, but you are bound, in theory at least, by these uh, 10 Buddhist virtues. So all of this stuff was you know, bound up with the person of the king. So when, in the case of Sri Lanka and uh, Burma, the British decided to get rid of the monarchy, it's a huge crisis. Uh, but this same crisis takes place really in different ways, a little bit less extreme, less suddenly, in the cases of Thailand and Cambodia and Laos. As I said, the 20th century, I think, is, particularly in the case of the mainland Southeast Asian Theravada states, they're all trying to solve this question of how do we replace the role of the monarch in defending the, and patronising the Buddhist religion? In the case of Thailand, you don't have to replace it because the king is, particularly the guy they've got now, is, um, is very much in, in charge. But for the other ones, you know, the, the new governments have had to take over the role of, of the monarch in protecting and defending Buddhism. So in, in Thailand, we have this, well, it's an insurgency in southern Thailand in I think it's three of the provinces in particular. Again, that is something we hear very little about at the moment. What is the state of play in southern Thailand? Sure. This conflict has been going on for at least 400 years <laughs> and it comes down again to a a very important aspect of the history of the South. From about the 16th century, a very powerful and prosperous sultanate developed in uh, what is now Southern Thailand. It was called the Patani Sultanate. Very famous, became very, very rich. It was a trading state and also became an Islamic centre. It's a really significant state and becomes a really important centre for Islamic scholarship that's known throughout Southeast Asia. So, you know, the Javanese, the Malays, they all know Patani. Patani is very famous. Now, Patani was never sort of powerful enough to escape the sort of gravity of the Thai state in the north. You know, sometimes they try to pull themselves free and the Thais would send down an army and, and they'd sort of basically make up and pay tribute and uh, sort of carry on, more or less independent. 
that all changed at the end of the 18th century where the Thais thought enough is enough. They went down and they just destroyed the city of Patani. Um, they depopulated the whole region. That was basically the end of the Patani Sultanate. And the Malays, and they're ethnic Malay in this region, but they're ethnic Malays who speak a, a dialect, a Patani Malay dialect, and their whole kind of worldview is bound up with this old Patani Sultan. Because there are Muslims all over Thailand, right? But this is something which concerns the Malays who are descendants of this old Patani Sultanate. Now, over the course of the 20th century, as we've been talking about with the rise of the nation state, Thailand wasn't colonized, so they were a little bit ahead of the game. They're trying to create a nation state, make everyone feel that they're Thai. And you know, Buddhism becomes a part of Thai national identity. This creates a big problem for the Patani people who still remain down there for whom you know, Islam and their Malay identity is central. So things go from bad to worse. And by the 1960s, what I would call uh, kind of a sort of a secularly oriented national liberation movement, a bit like the PLO in the Palestinian territories back then in, in the 1960s, right? So it's a militant movement. There's bombings. By the way, the Thai military is also extremely brutal in the way that it goes about suppressing this insurgency. So that, that continues off and on. It's a little bit more complex than that. But in the 1980s, something very interesting happens. That is a kind of an Islamist ideology starts to influence, as it does most other parts of the Muslim world, these radicals. Whereas before they were kind of kind of secular national liberation guys, now they become sort of Islamists and they start talking about Islamic State, so on and so on. Uh, for complicated reasons, basically internal reasons. It was not sort of orchestrated by Al-Qaeda or any other terrorist group operating in the Middle East, not at all. It's all internally driven. Um, it starts up again in the early 2000s. And once again, it's crushed very brutally. I think seven or 8,000 people have been killed. At one stage, it was the bloodiest insurgency in Southeast Asia. It's quiet now, but it's sort of still on the boil. You, there are still sort of incidents every now and again. And it's just one of those intractable ethno-nationalist disputes. To me, one way of thinking about it is you know, Northern Ireland. I think that there's a kind of a sort of parallel with the dispute of that nature, which goes back centuries. You've got religion in there, but you've got a national identity as well. You've got a legacy of you know imperial dominance, et cetera, et cetera. You have this down in southern Thailand. Only very recently sort of started to take on aspects of a kind of a religious conflict. And I think that's, for the most part, agent provocateurs. They want to kind of turn it into a bigger conflict on both sides, I should say. But deep down what it really is, it's an ethno-nationalist dispute what the militants are really fighting for is autonomy in uh, the region of the former Patani Sultanate. Ruth, I, I liked Patrick's um, coupling, I suppose, of that situation in Thailand with Northern Ireland. Yeah, that's not fair because I was about to do that. <laughs> <laughs> about both Sri Lanka and, um, <laughs> well, yeah, definitely Sri Lanka. Um, so I'd say it's a similar thing in Sri Lanka, the north of Sri Lanka, and the borderlands between Burma and Bangladesh or Myanmar and Bangladesh, which is where we're having all of the trouble at the moment with Rakhine State and uh, the Muslim Buddhist interactions. Maybe I can claim Northern Ireland more. It's a bit different to Thailand because the British were involved <laughs> and practiced a divide and rule <laughs> strategy um, in those areas where they did a lot through the colonial infrastructure to separate and uh, create uh, different identities based on religion, both in Sri Lanka and in uh, the borderlands between uh, Bangladesh and Burma. Because you remember the British ruled Burma, what is now Bangladesh, and India as a combined state. I mean, they had specific yes. regional areas, but there was a lot of flow between the two. The delineation between the borders wasn't that clear, right? So um, in the case of Sri Lanka, you ended up with the same thing. You had a, an island with a significant minority on it that uh, sees itself being aligned with another community on a, on a mainland just across the water, the Tamils, but they're losing their identity to the majority on the island, which was the Sinhalese. But what you had um, happened there is, and that's what we're getting at today, is that the Sinhalese, the majority in Sri Lanka, they not only saw themselves as a religious identity, a cultural identity. Some of the early battles that were fought in Sri Lanka in the Civil War were actually about language as opposed to religion because they brought in a, a law that there was only one language supposed to be the national language of Sri Lanka after it got independence. But also along with that came this idea that the language 
It was infused with Buddhist blessings because it was an Indian language. And also, even at that point, there was some really bit disturbing stuff because it was the 30s and 40s that said that the Sinhalese were Aryan and had connections to North India and therefore were superior to the, the less developed, even less fair Tamils in the North. So you have this combination of basically racism and the idea of religious and linguistic purity. And then there was also this idea of protecting Sri Lanka as a pure land for Buddhism. And so to take on what Patrick was saying about the kings, the rulers, the new rulers were supposed to step up and perform the role of the king in protecting Buddhism. Um, So rather than do it through their armies or through ritual, they started doing it through religious protection acts and setting up special laws that protected Buddhism, doing it legally as opposed to imperial statements and rituals. But there was one more thing that I was going to add that's a bit weird about Sri Lanka uh, that people maybe don't know as much is that Sri Lanka is also said to be special because the people there are said to be the protectors of one of the most important relics of the Buddha, which is the Buddha's tooth, which is housed in a temple in Kandy in the middle of Sri Lanka. And there's this idea that they've got a special role to protect that relic and that temple. The Tooth Relic Temple has played an important role in Sri Lankan history as a symbol of Buddhist identity for the uh, Buddhists of the Sri Lankan island. You're listening to Ear to Asia from Asia Institute at the University of Melbourne. And just a reminder to listeners about Asia Institute's online publication on Asia and its societies, politics and cultures. It's called the Melbourne Asia Review. It's free to read and it's open access at melbourneasiareview.edu.au. You'll find articles by some of our regular Ear to Asia guests and by many others. Plus, you can catch recent episodes of Ear to Asia at the Melbourne Asia Review website, which again, you can find at melbourneasiareview.edu.au. I'm Jane Hutchin, and I'm joined by cultural historian of South Asia, Dr. Ruth Gamble, and Southeast Asia historian, Associate Professor Patrick Jury. We're looking at how religion and ethnicity interface with politics in Buddhist majority countries. I'd be interested to hear from you both how Buddhism and Buddhist culture, in a sense, has intersected in these countries' society and politics. Patrick, you first, perhaps? Yeah, what I would say is that if we think of the secularization process that occurs in the West. We're most familiar, of course, with the politics as it's practiced in in the West, in Europe, in the US, and here in Australia. And that's predicated to a certain extent on secular societies. And those secular societies were produced through you know, centuries of, of, of secularization, really arguably dating back to the Reformation, where the, the Protestants split off from the Catholic Church, et cetera, et cetera. That process of secularization is much more recent and much less developed in the Theravada countries of Southeast Asia. And it was really interrupted, stimulated perhaps is a better word, by the coming of the colonial powers to Southeast Asia, most extreme form, the abolition of the monarchy in Myanmar. Um, these societies as they're drawn into a global economy, there are all kinds of social changes that are taking place that also drive internal political changes. And the most clearest case is the 1932 overthrow of the Thai absent monarchy. That takes place not by colonial powers. This is driven by Thais. So once religion becomes disconnected from the monarch, I think that this is a really important moment in a country's history. This moment is very recent for the Theravada Buddhist countries in Southeast Asia, a little bit older in Sri Lanka, but you know, just early 19th century where the British also got rid of the monarchy there. So I would argue that the, the secularization process in uh, the mainland uh, Southeast Asian countries is less advanced. And for that reason, these societies, they're very religious. I think there was a, might've been a Pew Center poll saying, I think that Thailand was the most religious country in the world, which, which surprised me, but they, they are, they're religious places. If you talk to people there, even on the face of it, sometimes they you, you can't see it because 
maybe we we're not looking for the right things, but th- these societies, I think, are quite religious. And you know, the politics, I think, perhaps arguably, that uh, may be a certain obstacle to a greater democratization of politics in Southeast Asia. There are other factors involved, but particularly, I think, in the case of well, Thailand, maybe in the case of Myanmar too, uh, with, with the military, Buddhism is so kind of bound up with those two governing bodies that um, I think democratization sometimes has a hard time in, in kind of establishing itself. Ruth, what kind of an imprint have you seen? I definitely agree with everything that Patrick was saying, and there's a couple of other things I was thinking when you were speaking. I'm always struck by how much the Chinese state seeks to control um, monastic institutions because it understands, I think correctly, that as long as you have large monastic institutions, you have a alternate source of power that can undermine your will, right? And I think that we've seen that repeatedly. We definitely saw it in Burma with the Saffron uh, Revolution and the, and the uprisings in those cases. I think there's always a tension when you have very re- religious countries, as Patrick was saying, with these large organisations of monastic institutions, you're always going to have a tension between the government and those institutions. If it's working properly, the monks are supposed to check that the government's doing the right thing and the government is supposed to check, or the king in the olden days is supposed to check that the monks are doing the right thing. Um, But that, that idea that they're supposed to check up on each other as opposed to being completely separate is a different model. And the other thing I would say is that there's also a tension in that the monk's primary role is to beg to get alms from the populace and the populace's primary role in this is to make offerings to the monks. Uh, So that economic dynamic is a very different uh, sheen on top of the the politics of the place uh, than you would have in other countries. Ruth, you spoke briefly about the Rohingya. Mm. Talk a bit more about what has happened with Myanmar being predominantly Buddhist What is the military regime there doing to, if anything, which doesn't appear to be much at all, douse the flames of of Buddhist nationalism? I don't think they're doing much at all. I think they're playing on it. And I do think it's very much a Buddhist issue. It's also a border issue because there's intense tensions there. But it's basically that idea of making the entire land of Burma, that idea of territorial exclusion and coming up with a Buddhist exceptionalism and saying we have to get rid of all of these people, push them all out of Burma. And so then you're getting pushed back from the Muslims of the region who, like Bangladesh is a majority Muslim state just next door, but it also has a significant minority of Buddhists, mainly from the Jakma minority, and they're getting tend to get pushed out of Bangladesh and sidelined in Bangladesh. So you're getting this uh, Buddhist Uh, Muslim tensions all along that border region. And it's all about that idea of majorities trying to have a national identity, a singular national identity in a singular sovereign space that's causing this awful tensions for the people on the ground who used to live in a much more mixed way. And the other thing is that it spreads you're getting Buddhist Muslim tensions, then the tensions there spread to Sri Lanka and spread um, through South Asia. And you had some terrorist attacks at the place where the Buddha is said to have achieved enlightenment in Bog Gaya. Um, there was a, an extremist attack on the temple at Bog Gaya, and that fed into more tensions. The tensions keep blowing up on either side. Patrick, you said a little earlier that you felt that um, Buddhism in Thailand was perhaps more regulated. What about this issue of um, tensions crossing borders? Have, have you seen that in Thailand? Not really. My view is these tensions tend to be internally driven. Thailand has a very long experience of dealing with very successfully actually the Muslim community. I mean, there's lots of different groups, you know, the the Persians came, the Arab traders, the Javanese, so on and so on. Even today, um, Muslims, large areas in Bangkok, there's no problem. uh, There's no kind of real religious divide between people who have friends, they go to the same schools, universities, etc. The real tension in Thailand is that southern border region I I, I just talked about. Um, Having said that, I think that there's another huge political conflict in Thailand, which I think 
plays into maybe an increasing interest in Buddhism at the political level. And that is the tension surrounding the monarchy and the monarchy's in involvement in politics. And this goes back to a coup against the democratically elected Thaksin government in 2006. There's another coup in 2014, which is more kind of hardcore. They thought they'd get rid of him the first time he came back, so they thought they'd do a better job. He's still around. Actually, his party will probably win the next election. But this coup was backed by the monarchy and the military. The monarchy and the military are kind of like uh, very closely related because they felt the Thaksin and a, a democratically elected parliament was usurping the role of the monarch. So Thailand kind of, they can't leave behind this idea of, of the absolute monarchy, at least the royalists, the, the kind of hardcore royalists. The monarchy has got to be in charge. So right now there's this, this big tension about the role of the monarchy in politics. And uh, the current monarch is unlike his father, who King Pumipon, who passed away in 2016, he cultivated the image of a bodhisattva king, you know, a morally pure being. A l- large part of the population really did see him as a very uh, virtuous king in the Buddhist sense. His son doesn't have that whatsoever. As famously, uh, he does hit headlines. You know, he has got a very bizarre personal life. So he, he is not in the image of the traditional Buddhist ruler. And there are sort of Buddhists on, on both sides of the fence who are I think, sort of dissatisfied with the behaviour of the monarch. And as this is happening, we're seeing now, I think, a politicisation of Buddhism because the monarchy is no longer the moral anchor. It might sound a bit bizarre because we don't live in a kind of an absolute monarchy. It's kind of like a, a moral anchor and that no longer exists with the new king. So I think that there's increasing interest in Buddhism and you're getting some Buddhist groups are calling for Buddhism to be declared de facto the state religion of Thailand. It is not the jure currently the state religion. It is probably is de facto, but uh, there are groups who, who want Buddhism to have more state support. And there are others who are on the more kind of progressive democratic side who are calling for Buddhism uh, and the state to be clearly separated, and they clearly are not at the moment. That whole debate is going on, on right now, quite apart from the problems with the, the insurgency in the South. It's a fascinating situation and, and of course, the situations in the different countries are are very, very different. Ruth, I wonder if you can talk a bit about the the key personalities. And I know Myanmar and Sri Lanka have got very outspoken, if you like, uh, spokespeople, leaders of these uh, nationalistic movements. To what extent are the movements being really driven by these personalities? I think in some ways they're not being driven by the personalities as much as it has been reported. I think there's definitely extremists within most communities. I mean, if you're going to look at Sri Lanka now, it's being driven by economy collapsing, you know. Um, That's the biggest driver um, for change and and what's happening there at the moment. Um, They got rid of the government that had been there for decades recently because there was an economic collapse. And, and people started getting on boats again um, because it was so desperate. And also, I was just recently in India and there were Sri Lankan monks wandering around all over the place um, looking for arms. I saw several times big groups of them because there's no money left in uh, Sri Lanka, so they've come across to India to, to beg. But there are some key personalities. So I wasn't saying that these people aren't drivers of tension and aren't playing on nationalism. So in Sri Lanka, you have a figure like Ghana Saratero, who has been put in jail for inciting violence against Muslims. His group, the Boda Bala Sena, uh, BBS or Buddhist Power Force. <laughs> Sena actually means army, um, but they changed it to force in English to sound less scary. He was released, wasn't he? Yeah, he was put in jail and then he was released. But he was put in jail for issuing personal threats. But that kind of militant element of the Buddhist sangha, the the monks, and I note that it's monks and there's no nuns involved in this, right? It's very kind of macho monks thing. They kept pushing the government to not give in to the Tamil insurgency during the civil war with the Hindu Tamils in the north. And now that that war is over and over thanks to some horrendous uh, human rights violations, they've now moved on to saying that it's the Muslims that are the problem. So I do think that you are getting some line up here because there's also a reconfiguration that I do think in South Asia brings the Modi government in India into play because this is spilling over into Northeast India as well, where the Modi government considers 
Buddhists to be Hindus. So they're allowed to migrate into India and then they're chucking Muslims out in the Northeast and not actually can't become Indian citizens. So you're getting this whole uh, realignment and this whole movement happening through that area. Chakma Buddhists going up into Northeast India, uh, the Rohingyas, some of them resettling in Bangladesh, and then the kind of Sri Lankan realignment with Indian nationalism, presenting the Muslims as a kind of generic enemy. And not everyone buys into that, right? There's an amazing amount of peace movements and the government is, I mean, in Sri Lanka, the new government is, you know, nominally secular. They're not buying into this. But when it's a nationalist cause, they have to answer to this. It makes it harder for them to back down against perceived threats. We're used to that, right? We see it in other parts around the world as well. If you have people agitating for nationalism, it's hard for the government. It tends to draw centrist governments to the right. So I think you'd have a similar thing going on in Sri Lanka. If I could just make one point. If we go back to Myanmar, it's under a military dictatorship, hardcore military dictatorship for, you know, 60 years. And in 2011, they start to open up. They kind of do a deal with the US and and the, the Europeans and they start to democratize, open the country up. And it's just then that this Buddhist militancy starts up. So ironically, it's kind of related to Myanmar's democratization, which of course was uh, killed dead last year with with the coup. But before then, there is a correlation between Myanmar's uh, democratization and the politicization of Buddhism, and including in militancy. Politicization doesn't necessarily have to be militant, but I think it's connected to the democratization. And I think in the case of Thailand, maybe less so Cambodia and Laos, for political reasons. But in Thailand, there's a a really now strong movement, a pro-democratic movement, which is kind of lining itself up against, to be straightforward about it, against the monarchy and the military. And that's where we see, you know, Buddhism again being politicized. So I think there's some interesting relations or connections between democratization and politicization. If I could make just one final point, sorry to go on, but I think this is really important one. Please do. When we're talking about uh, Buddhism and politics, Myanmar, Thailand, and I think also Bhutan do not allow Buddhist monks or nuns or or novices to vote or to run uh, for a political office. They're forbidden from doing that constitutionally. And so the question is, isn't this a kind of anti-democratic infringement of human rights? Well, from a Buddhist point of view, at least the people who made these laws, no, because the Buddhist monk within the Theravada tradition at least is understood to be what's called a field of merit. So uh, the monks have to kind of do their duties. They've got to follow the Vinaya, the, the discipline, the, the monastic discipline, lay down scriptures to be, you know, virtuous monks. And almost every day the laity will uh, make merit. That's kind of the very, very basic everyday kind of Buddhist practice that, that most Buddhists would do. It's not meditation. It's not all this other stuff. It's making merit. That is giving food to the monks, presenting them with robes. You're looking after the temples, maybe restoring the temple, all of this kind of stuff. So there's a view within that kind of Theravada tradition that if Buddhists become too politicized, they're starting to be, you know, become interested in power, in money, in greed, grasping, which all you know, leads to suffering in that Buddhist sense. So they're forsaking their duty as a field of merit. They're forsaking their duty to the laity. You know, in all of these countries, you do have Buddhists become involved in politics one time or another. On the other side, I think, and I think this is fair to say, even, you know, amongst the more sort of you know, democratically progressively minded Buddhists, that it's just seen to be a bit unseemly for Buddhist monks to become overly politicized because they're forsaking their duty as Buddhist monks, providing a field of merit for the laity to make merit, to improve their lifetimes and to be born in in a better incarnation in your future life. So that is one thing which may prevent a further politicization of Buddhism. A lot of people think, you know, these guys are going a little bit too far. They may kind of sympathize with them and they certainly want to kind of protect the Buddhist religion if they feel that it's being, you know, in danger by whether it's Muslims or whatever it might be. Um, They're a little bit reticent to see Buddhist monks actually taking political action Well, that has been an absolutely fascinating discussion. Patrick Jory and Ruth Gamble, thank you so much for joining us on Ear to Asia. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Our guests have been Associate Professor Patrick Jory from the University of Queensland and Dr Ruth Gamble from La Trobe University.
Ear to Asia is brought to you by Asia Institute of the University of Melbourne, Australia. You can find more information about this and all our other episodes at the Asia Institute website. Be sure to keep up with every episode of Ear to Asia by following us on the Apple Podcast app, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. Please rate and review us. It helps new listeners find the show. And do put in a good word for us on social media. This episode was recorded on the 28th of June, 2022. Producers were Kelvin Parham and Eric Van Bemmel of Profactual.com. Ear to Asia is licensed under Creative Commons, copyright 2022, the University of Melbourne. I'm Jane Hutchin. Thanks for your company.